Um, first of all, sorry for not being able to attend yesterday. Some of you can probably tell from my voice, I have a bug in my system. Caught it from somewhere. And I figured I'd try and stay alive long enough to deliver this talk, which I ske was scheduled to do. Now, we are agents, you know, one might say. And as such, we commit numerous actions on a daily basis. It seems that an increasing number of our actions are virtual. Now, let's tentatively say that a virtual action is an action initiated by user in a virtual environment that involves only persons and objects within that environment. So a paradigmatic example would be, say, opening a door in a first-person shooter or lifting a box. Now, we seem to refer to actions, virtual actions, in our talk and argue about them. It seems that we are committed to their existence. Otherwise, it would be difficult to see what we would be, we would be talking about and what would make our talk true. Now, actions are usually categorized as a subclass of events, and it's common to treat these courses about actions as being about events. Now, it seems to follow that if virtual actions are kinds of actions and the commitment to then, and actions are kinds of events, then a commitment to virtual actions seems to entail a commitment to virtual events. And the question I want to ask is, do we need to admit these kinds of things, entities, virtual actions, into our ontology in order to talk about uh, things that happenings in virtual communities, video games, and so on? Now, how do we figure out which theories are uh, better, which are worse? Well, by looking at certain problem cases. So I propose that let's comp compare theories in light of how they deal with two problem cases. Uh, both of them should be familiar to you from the literature. The first one is the classic sort of instance of virtual rape, uh, first discussed by Julian Debell. took place in Lambda Mu, which was a text-based mud where one player's avatar took control of another player's avatar and performed various kinds of well, nasty sexual actions with it. Of course, since it was a text-based environment, uh, all the actions were say, simply uh, written descriptions visible to everyone who happened to be logged on at the time. Question, was this an instance of virtual rape? Now, that's a controversial question in itself, and I don't propose to answer that. I just want to see how different ways of looking at virtual actions would answer this question. Second question, or problem case, goes as follows. In 2009, uh, Dutch judges purportedly uh, convicted three minors of theft for stealing virtual furniture in the virtual world of the online multiplayer game Habo. The game consists, as most of you know, of a virtual hotel where players can furnish their own room. Perpetrators obtained the usernames and passwords of other players by deceit, accessed their accounts, and transferred their virtual furniture to their own accounts and rooms. Was this virtual theft? If yes, was it morally wrong? Again, answers here, answers to these questions depend in part on how we understand virtual actions. What kinds of things are they? Now, how do we figure out what we are committed to ontologically in our talk? Well, one classical criterion for coming from Quine, Willard von Norman Quine, says that a theory or a piece of language or discourse is committed to those and only those entities to which the bound variables of the theory must refer to in order for the statements made in that theory to be true. In other words, what Quine says is we should take a theory or a fragment of a language regimented in, say, first order logic and those statements, those variables that fall within the scope of our existential quantifiers are the ones that the existence of which we are committed to. And I propose to adopt this criterion for determining what exists in which, according to which theory. Now, for this I need to introduce a bit of first order logic, but I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Basically, we'll say that it's a language that involves, it, I'm only going to introduce a fragment of it, so it's a language which includes predicate symbols, um, say, is a plumber, is uh, a door, and so on. Constants, uh, say, Mario, Bowser, Luigi. Uh, connectives, in this case, we're only interested in one, which is and, that's the wedge. And the existential quantifier, and variables. These are placeholders for individuals. So, so you see, and on the slides, you can see the, what, what the atomic formulas look like. So, for example, if you look at the second to last line, 
that should be read as there is something such that there is at least one thing such that that thing, for example, is a plumber. Now, according to Poin's criterion, because the expression px some, something is a uh, is a plumber falls within the scope of the existential quantifier, we are committed to the existence of plumbers in this case. So anything that is in the parentheses after the existential quantifier, we are committed to. To put it very simply. Now, if we want to compete theor compare theories, oh, by the way, a few words why I want to accept this uh, criterion. First of all, it allows us to discuss uh, disagreeing ontologies without committing to them. So, for example, if you and I disagree about, say, whether there are numbers, I say there are none, in the platonic sense you say there are, then I can't let my word number refer to the same kinds of things as you do. However, we can still talk about the kinds of statements either one of us affirms. Secondly, we have a common ground for disagreements. Say, if we disagree about whether there are numbers, we can still uh, argue over semantic matters. And finally, it gives us a simple method for comparing ontological commitments of different theories. Again, without forcing us to adopt their respective vocabularies. So how do we adjudicate between competing theories? Well, the I propose the following criteria uh, for a cost benefit, ontological cost-benefit analysis. This is not an exhaustive list of criteria. But a few words are in order. So what do I, what do I mean by ontological parsimony? Well, a good ontology, a good sort of theory of what kinds of things there are, should yield to Occam's razor. In other words, we shouldn't have more entities in our ontology than is necessary. This is a pretty standard requirement uh, recognized by most philosophers, although it is hard to spell out exactly what do we mean, quantitative, qualitative. Let's leave it as it is for now. The second criterion. Why should we want our ontological categories to be faithful to ordinary language? Well, it's desirable, I, I think, in the context of philosophy, because philosophical theories are couched in ordinary language, and their philosophical concepts originate from everyday discourse. In other words, and hence, philosophy isn't like mathematics, that is, a sort of, uh, an, in a way, an artificial lan independent language onto its own. It takes its cues, its evidence, and so on from everyday experience in ordinary life. Now, the third criterion, epistemic risk, it rests on the idea that in metaphysical theorizing, we want to strike a balance between parsimony and explanatory power. And this is summarized in the fundamental ontological trade-off. This says that there's a compromise between explanatory, the explanatory power of a theory and the epistemic risks associated with its acceptance. And this is manifest and the choice between an ontologically rich but epistemically risky theory with high explanatory power and an ontologically parsimonious but epistemically safe theory with limited explanatory power. What this means is, if I have a lot of various kinds of things, you know, numbers, abstract objects, people, tables, chairs, whatever in my ontology, then it is easier for me to explain a lot of observable phenomena. On the other hand, the more things I admit, the riskier the theory becomes because it's harder to believe that all these things exist and it's harder to verify that they do. On the other hand, the fewer things I have in my inventory of what there is, well, the less risks I take. But the harder it is for me to explain numerous interesting cases because I have less resources to, for doing so. And I propose that we should adopt the principle of least epistemic risk when weighing the trade-off between explanatory power and epistemic risk. And this says that when competing ontological claims are made, we should determine the degree of epistemic risk associated with the methods used for establishing or denying the existence of the entity in question, and make an ontological choice based on the method with the lowest risk. So what this says, in other words, is that uh, we should assess the methods by which we can determine what kinds of things there are, say intuition, observation, scientific measurement, and so on, and use that as a guideline for figuring out, uh, for weighing risks and explanatory power. And finally, of course, the fourth criterion says that philosophy isn't an end in itself, but it should actually be able to solve some pressing, answer some pressing <coughs> questions. So, consider this. Uh, let's take a simple example of an action, statement about an action, and see how, what it commits us to. 
So suppose we have a sentence about what's going on in this picture. Mario kicked Bowser. Bowser doesn't look very happy about it, now does he? Now, one standard way of, say, formalizing it would be to say, kicked Mario Bowser, where kicked is a two-place predicate. But Donald Davidson, in his influential theory, says that no, the correct way of regimenting this sentence would be uh, number three. There, there exists an event such that uh, there is an event E such that E is the kicking of Bowser by Mario. Um, and Davidson has a number of reasons. In other words, we think that these kinds of uh, predicates have a third hidden event variable. Now, notice that in light of our criterion, this commits us to the existence of events. Now, events don't come free. They have their own costs and benefits. I don't have time to go into all the costs and benefits here, but needless to say, um, it, uh, adopt, accepting events allows us, for example, to account for certain acceptable and common sense inferences, and it allows us to talk about and explain how we can talk about the same event under different descriptions. <coughs> the costs, however, are at least two. First of all, nobody has uh, an acceptable account of what events are, what kinds of things they are. Some say they're particulars, others that say they're universals, it's a matter of debate. And secondly, we don't really have good identity <coughs> criteria for events. We don't know exactly when to say that uh, given two events, they're one and the same. But again, I won't go into these details. Notice that <coughs> if we say Mario gave Bowser a virtual kick, if we regiment that, as Davidson suggests, we get there exists an event, there is an event such that it is the kicking of Mar Bowser by Mario, and that event is virtual. Now notice this doesn't tell us much because we don't know what virtual means in this case. So what we need to look at is different ways of how the concept of virtuality is treated to understand what it means to be committed to the existence of virtual events. Now one famous view, which I'd like to call the fictional view, says that X is a virtual F, where F can be whatever, if it's not an actual F, but is as if an F, due to its capacities. In other words, this is the view which says the virtual entities are accompanied by make-believe, that they're somehow imaginary, because they're not real, and their existence depends on the imagination and shared beliefs of people. So this suggests that computer game characters, for example, are similar to those found in novels. Notice that if we regiment, you know, Mario gave Bowser a virtual kick. According to this theory, theory what we get is that there is an event uh, such that it's <coughs> an event where Mario kicked Bowser, and this event is fictional. So notice now, because we treat all vir virtual things as fictional things, we're committed to the existence of fictional events. So far, so good. I mean, novels are full of fictional events, so what's the problem, right? Well, it does have some benefits. Sometimes, in everyday language, we do talk about <coughs> uh, virtual things and events as if they're fictional. But it has its costs as well. First of all, it puts virtual actions beyond morality. Namely, if we equate virtuality with fiction, then we could argue that virtual actions can't be morally wrong, because they're fictional, and only real actions can have moral value. So we'll follow that virtual theft isn't morally wrong, and neither is virtual rape, because both are akin to fictional episodes in literature and, or film, and we, don't, and we do not condemn real people for fictional acts. So this seems to put all uh, virtual actions outside the sphere of morality. Secondly, it has low explanatory power. As the bell noted, um, the so-called virtual rape in Lambda Mu had real psychological uh, repercussions for those involved. The player whose avatar was the victim of those kinds of performances uh, had suffered real psychological distress. Again, this is something that this view can't account for. And finally, it, this view adopt, accepts the um, virtual real opposition, which says that there's an ontological difference in kind between virtual and real entities. The problem with this distinction, which is pretty common, is that it's not a neutral ontological distinction. It's a normative distinction that uh, uh, a priori equates virtuality with unreality. And it's, Rarely supported by evidence, rather philosophers tend to adopt it to support some conclusion that they already want to establish. The second view is the simulation view. This says that uh, virtual entities are interactive computer simulations. 
if we regiment our kicking sentence in this way, then what, what we're committed to are the existence of interactive computer simulations, as you can see from the formula. So the uh, kicking event is simply an interactive computer simulated kicking event. Okay, so far so good. Again, this view has some benefits. If we, some virtual actions can be morally wrong. For example, virtual actions that have extra virtual consequences, consequences that extend outside the simulation or outside the game. We could evaluate those kinds of actions, and that's okay. Secondly, it does have high explanatory power. We can say that if there was real psychological distress in the virtual rape case, then it was morally wrong. Secondly, we can say that uh, if uh, you know, the virtual furniture is stolen, uh, satisfied some criteria requirements of having real value, then the theft was wrong. So it has explanatory power. And it is faithful to everyday language, because we, when we talk about virtual entities, we often mean that they're somehow computer simulated. It has, however, some you know, uh, costs. First of all, if our definition of virtual says that all virtual things are interactive computer simulations, then such a definition is threatened by circularity, because the meaning of virtual is tied to specific technologies. And it follows that the identification of virtuality presupposes the identification of certain technologies, while the identification of these technologies presupposes the definition of virtual. So we're getting kind of circular. Secondly, what about uh, virtual actions, the uh, consequences of which do not go beyond uh, the computer simulation? It seems conceivable, at least, that some of those actions might also be worth moral praise or condemnation. But this view doesn't really give us the resources to do that. It says that we can only evaluate those actions that extend beyond the simulation. And finally, what are computer simulations? Well, one answer is that they are models. But what are models? It's a big debate in philosophy of science. Are they abstract objects, set theoretics, objects, so on? So again, we're committed to entities that we don't fully understand. Now, the alternative, and I will probably go a few minutes over time, the one I'd like to propose is what I call the similarity view. This says that <coughs> if I say that an X is a virtual F, I'm just saying that it's almost the same as a Y that is an F. In other words, if I say that um, Mario gave Bowser a virtual kick, I'm saying that the kicking is just almost the same as our paradigmatic typical example of kicking. And that's it. So this rests on a couple of assumptions. First of all, I'm assuming a prototype theory of concepts in the sense that I'm assuming that concepts cannot be given by definitions, but they have typical exemplars that we use as heuristics to identify whether a concept applies or not. So for example, uh, the concept conference talk as a typical exemplar. If I was here in a clown suit cycling around on a unicycle, then this wouldn't be a typical example of a conference talk. So you would be less likely to say that what he's doing is giving a conference talk. Now that I'm dressed very, in a very boring manner and talking about very boring things, you might say that, okay, this is more typical of a conference talk. And you might classify this as a conference talk. So according to this interpretation, the word virtual is a linguistic hedge. A word whose job is to make things fuzzier or less fuzzy. It influences the truth values of statements. It does not draw any ontological distinctions whatever. It's like the word very or almost. There's no distinction between uh, being blue and being very blue. They're not different categories of blue. Likewise, there's no distinction between being a bird and being almost a bird. We don't have birds and almost birds. We have just we attenuate when we say that something is almost a bird. Same thing with the word virtual. Now, ca to capture this idea, um, I propose that we adopt a, to regiment these statements about, say, virtual actions, Mario's kicking Bowser, and so on, I propose that we adopt a view that's been out of fashion for a while, for adverbial modification, which is called the operator approach. It treats modifiers like virtual, very, almost as functionally, functional unary operators that change the truth values of their expressions. This view can be developed in different ways, but I'm going to use the framework of fuzzy logic to do so. Again, very simply, the vocabulary of our fuzzy logic is the same as the one I introduced. The only difference is in the semantics. Whereas in the previous version of the logic, every formula is either true or false and nothing else then here, every formula has a truth degree of, say, uh, 
one, as a truth degree, that's one real number between zero and one, which represents a degree of truth. And the meaning of virtual is represented by an operator, which read as it is virtually true that, and is defined by the function given on the screen. And I'll explain it in terms of through the examples to save some time. Basically, what this says is, if a statement is almost close to absolute truth, if I say it is virtually true that, say Mario kicked Bowser, th then it follows that it is absolutely true. If a statement is absolutely true, then hedging it makes it false. And if it's less than almost absolutely true, but not entirely false, then I make the statement slightly more true by hedging it. So how does this work out in the case of Mario kicked Bowser? What's the benefit? Well, first of all, it's parsimonious. By the way, this is my last slide, so wrapping up. It's parsimonious. First of all, we could regiment Mario gave Bowser a virtual kick as in the first formula, virtually kicked Mario Bowser. And this simply has some truth degree. But notice, we're not committed to events, and we're not committed to virtual things because the operator doesn't refer to anything. Or, if we do need events, we can introduce them, but notice in the second formula, we're not committed to virtual events, because again, the operator virtually doesn't refer to anything. It just modifies the truth value of the formulas in the parentheses. Secondly, it is faithful to ordinary language because we oftentimes say, when we say that one thing is virtually like another, we say it's almost like another. And also, if you say train soldiers in a virtual simulator, they don't think that they're doing something fictional. They do more often than not think that what they're doing is almost the same as a real battlefield situation and might be applicable later down the line. So that, third, there's low epistemic risk because we're not committed to mysterious entities at all. We can perhaps get rid of events, but we're certainly not committed to the existence of virtual things. There's no the opposition between virtual and virtuality and reality, because according to this view, virtual, the word virtual doesn't draw ontological distinctions. And we can explain all our uh, problem cases. A virtual rape was morally wrong if it's sufficiently similar to typical instances. Same with virtual theft. Two problems. First of all, it makes our logic messy, but I think that having a parsimonious ontology trumps having a messy logic. And secondly, it makes it hard to formulate clear-cut general rules that we could apply to all virtual actions. We have to look at each instance on a case-by-case -case basis. But I'm about two minutes and 48 seconds over time, so thank you. I'm sure not all of this was entirely clear, so please feel free to ask questions. That was really fascinating, um, the interesting piece of metaphysics. So uh, here's, here's the first thing to fess over. I think one of the ways we use virtual and everyday language is, is to locate something within a particular kind of environment. Um, and the problem that I see with your analysis for that kind of usage is that we have certain kinds of categories of actions that only take place in those environments. So take, for example, a, a respawning, right? Um, a respawning can only take place in a game world, as far as we know, unless there's some odd, slightly metaphorical use for it here. Um, so, but the way you're analyzing the word virtual, uh, a respawning in a game would have to be an almost respawning, or a near respawning. Um, I, I can't make any sense of that, that way of parsing uh, 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 that particular sort of predicate, or, or a predicate like, um, uh, I'm trying to think of other examples to take a, a, a slightly frivolous one, opponent, right? The kind of victory that you only get in the virtual world. Um, your analysis again treat, treats that as though it's, 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 it's a near equivalent of something in the real world, but we don't really have any use for those predicates in, describe, in describing the real world. So could you talk about how, how your treatment of the word virtual uh, copes with those sorts of examples? Thank you. That's one thing I had to gloss over. Uh, another thing that this... Um, that the account I'm proposing involves is that if I say, for example, that Mario gave Bowser a virtual kick, again, a virtual kicks are kicks only in certain kinds of environments, as you said, then it's not the word virtual that does the referring, it, uh, we, but we determine whether we're talking about kicks in certain kinds of environments by the context in which we use the word kick. Same thing with pawning, same thing with respawning. So it's the context of use that determines reference, not the word virtual. So if I say, if Mario and Bowser, in that context where I'm using that sentence, are video game characters, then the kick refers to what goes on.